Right, so we're coming towards the end of the course now, and um, we're going to just go try and quickly go through some uh, general trauma. Um, this won't necessarily apply to everyone that's in the community, but you may see these conditions being rehabilitated. So it's to give you a bit of a background about those, especially hip fractures as well. They're a huge cost and burden on the, on the healthcare system, both in terms of length of bed stay and cost and economics. So we'll just tell you a bit more about those and what we can potentially do to, to, Im to improve things. So um, that's me. I've just become Deputy Divisional Director in Surgery in Rotherham, which I start in July. So I'm looking forward to that. It'll be an interesting job. And these are the topics I'm going to go through. Uh, so we're going to go through proximal humerus fractures, so fractures at the top of the uh, shoulder, clavicle fractures, acromioclavicular joint injuries, which is the, um, the joints at the top of the shoulder as well, uh, wrist fractures, hip fractures, ACL injuries, tibial shaft fractures, and just some basics on ankle fractures. So starting off with proximal humerus fractures, um, proximal humerus normally breaks into sort of two pieces. All right, that's the most common type of fracture you'll get. Usually in the elderly population, osteoporotic fractures from a simple innocuous fall. The bone's a bit fragile, so they break into two pieces. And with those sorts of fractures, we don't we don't try and keep them in a sling for too long because the shoulder will become really really stiff and immobile. So um, we'll keep in the sling for about a week, and then we can start slowly start them uh, doing some pendular exercises. And you guys have probably got a protocol in your various areas as to how to get these sorts of fractures moving. It's the ones that are three or four part fractures that we get more worried about because the blood supply may be interrupted. Uh, and the reason that these develop into three or four part fractures is mainly due to the, de the deforming forces around the shoulder. So deforming forces are essentially where the muscles and tendons are attached to in the bone. They all pull in various directions, causing the bone to split into various areas. So you've got the articular segment, which is the, this is the uh, bit that's facing the socket. This is the ball bit facing the socket. You've got the greater tuberosity here, and this is where the supraspinatus tendon attaches onto, uh, the, one of the rotator cuff muscles. Then you've got the lesser tuberosity, which is where the infraspinatus and teres minor attach onto, they're the external rotators, as opposed to the abductor of the supraspinatus. And then you've got your humeral shaft, which is where the latissimus dorsi and pec major muscle attach onto. All right? And essentially, the more parts that the humerus fractures into, the more severe the injury is and the potential for things to go wrong, including the blood supply to be lost to the humeral head. So this is just an overview as to what I was just talking about. So there's the supraspinatus tendon attaching onto the greater tuberosity. That's the infraspinatus attaching onto the less tuberosity. And this is the latissimus dorsi attaching onto the uh, humeral shaft. And that's the head that's sort of fallen off, right? the ice cream falling off the cone. All right. um, so we normally put them in a sling for most of these fractures. One of the things you need to watch out for is the axillary nerve injury. All right. So the axillary nerve is a nerve that comes out from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. It comes out and it exits about five centimetres below the tip of the acromion. All right. You don't need to worry about that too much. But what you do need to think about is if that nerve's been injured, people will lose the function of the deltoid muscle, which is a main abductor. All right. Um, so in the context of an injury, it's quite hard to test the deltoid because it's quite painful and swollen. You can test for the twitching of the fibres, you know, just trying to get them to actively resist. But the mainstay of testing for that nerve would be testing of the sensation in what we call the regimental badge area, which is just this area here. So the nerve also supplies the sensation in that area. All right. So if you're looking at an x-ray, if you're ever faced with an x-ray, I know a lot of people are just faced with reports these days, but if you are ever faced with an x-ray, this is um, the sort of things you'd be looking for. So this is the humeral head, okay, all of this here. This is the greater tuberosity, which is where the supraspinatus attaches onto. This sort of projection here is the lesser tuberosity here, and this is the humeral shaft. So this is the ball of the ball and socket joints. This is the glenoid, which is the socket, all right? And up here is your acromion and your clavicle, all right? So that's what a normal x-ray looks like. And this is what a fracture, a four-part fracture, would look like. All right? So you've got your greater tuberosity fragment, your less tuberosity fragment, the articular head. You see there's a fracture line going through here as well. So that's separating the head from the shaft. So that's a four-part fracture. All right? And there's your glenoid, which is your socket. And this is just looking from another view. So this just d um, demonstrates the, re the importance of getting two views. So with any type of shoulder injury, it's really, really important to get two views. And the reason we get two views is because a shoulder can not only fracture, but it can also dislocate as well. All right. So dislocation means that the head, um, the ball and socket joint aren't articulating with each other. All right. And the only way to discern and identify 
the, the position of the dislocation is getting that second view. So either a lateral view, which is shooting from the side, or a top-down view, which you can do an axial view, all right, which is, well, it's actually shooting from there, or a top-down view, which is uh, looking from the top, which is sometimes called a Velpo view. All right? But either way, you need to get two views which are at 90 degrees to each other, which will allow you to differentiate between an anterior and a posterior dislocation. And just as um, sometimes it comes up in sort of random bits of text, but an anterior dislocation is usually due to this uh, abduction, external rotation sort of injury, someone falling out uh, from, a, from a standing height or a hard force in this sort of position. As you do that, it pushes the humeral head forward and comes out there. A posterior dislocation is usually the other way around, or internally rotated arm, that's the position of injury. But posterior dislocation usually occurs in um, either someone with epilepsy or uh, an electrocution, so someone's had an electric shock. All right? And that's because as the, as the arm rotates, internally rotates, it pulls backwards and all the muscles are electrocuted, but your internal rotators are stronger than your external rotators. All right? So your latissimus dorsi is stronger than everything else, and that pulls, that basically overpowers the external rotators, which is why you get a posterior dislocation with an electrocution. All right? That's a bit of pub knowledge there for you later on. Um, so proximal humerus fractures, these are the ways we can treat them. So plates and screws, all right? So three or four part fractures we're talking about now. Usually two part fractures we can get away without doing too much, all right? unless they're really, really displaced. Then we can do something called a hemiarthroplasty, which is um, basically, it's like a hip, you know, hemiarthroplasty. It's replacing half of the ball and socket anatomy. So we replace the uh, ball bit of the ball and socket. So that's the, a ball and then a stem that goes down the humeral shaft. And you can see there's like these two or three holes that are just situated in the side here. All right? So if we do this operation, usually what we'll also do is we'll take the rotator cuff tendons and then try and pass some sutures through these holes as well. So the rotator cuff tendons are actually attached into the prosthesis as well all right and that just means that the function is restored as well and then sometimes if it's a really severe fracture and we don't think we can restore the anatomy very well we'll do this which is called a reverse shoulder replacement it's called a reverse because you're essentially reversing the ball and socket anatomy all right so where the socket is we've put a ball and where the ball is we've put a socket all right that's why it's called a reverse so then everyone wonders why why why, why on earth do you do that well we do it because there's a so without getting too bogged down in biomechanics, um, essentially the way that forces occur around the shoulder, they're all rotational forces, right? So if you imagine my arm is going like that, it's a rotational force. You know, if you went in 360, it's a rotational force, right? And a, and a moment is a rotational force, right? So a moment is known as a rotational force. So the equation for a moment is force times distance. Okay, simple as that. Moment equals force times distance. Now, your force that's going to be generated, say you've got a supraspinatus tendon insufficiency and you can't abduct, all right, and you're struggling to abduct. Well, the only other abductor that's available is your deltoid, all right, and your deltoid can only function to a certain degree. If you put a reverse shoulder replacement in, you actually increase the distance of that muscle that's working, the deltoid muscle, all right. So by increasing that distance, if you remember moment equals force times distance, yeah, then you're not changing your force, but you're increasing your distance, so that moment will be greater. All right. So the reason that you do a reverse shoulder replacement is to increase that distance, and in doing so, you increase the moment. And by doing that, you enable the deltoid to have more power in the absence of supraspinatus function, all right? if that makes sense. Yeah? So if your supraspinatus isn't working, for whatever reason, and you think they've got a large rotator cuff tear attached to a dislocation or a fracture, or you don't think you can get the supraspinatus to tend them down and they're going to have weakness and abduction, this is when you would consider this replacement. All right? So clavicle fracture is quite a common injury, usually people falling off a, a bike, they can bimodal sort of distribution, but usually in the younger patients. 80% um, are in the middle third, and uh, you can either be on full arm, side stretch arm, but more commonly direct blow uh, to the clavicle itself. Cyclists, motorbike, no, motorbike, motorcyclists, they're the people who are at risk. So you've got to be careful with these, especially the ones in the middle third, because again, like everything in orthopedics, it comes down to deforming forces where the muscles are attaching onto. So... Imagine you get a break in the middle here. Well, this side, you've got the weight of the arm pulling down, the deltoid fascia, the pec major, which attaches into the humeral shaft, and that causes this to pull down and this to come up, all right? So that's going to tent the skin. On this side, the inside, you've got one of the neck muscles called your sternocleidomastoid, which basically pulls this fragment up. So essentially, you get two fragments which are tenting the skin. If they're left to tent the skin for more than 24 hours or so, you can suddenly develop um, skin necrosis, and the bone may suddenly start poking out through the skin, which is an emergency. So one of the first aid manoeuvres with this type of fracture is to try and take the tension off that, either by abducting the arm or putting them in a sling. All right? 
And if you do that, you prevent any of the complications associated with skin breakdown. And that's, that's an immediate step that needs to be taken because then we can manage the rest in a fracture clinic. But the skin side of things, if, the, if it's poking out through the skin, that's a very difficult complication because you've suddenly got an open fracture, all right, which the risks of infection, uh, wound healing problems are massive. All right. So um, just be aware of that. So in terms of clavicle fractures, if there's anything less than two centimetres of shortening, we don't get too worried about it. Um, generally because the function in the arm will still be pretty good and the hip bone will usually heal pretty well. And with these patients, we try and get them moving fairly early, within two to four weeks, and then we'll try and start strengthening at about 10 to 12 weeks or so. All right. And you've also got to remember the clavicle is the main bone that connects the arm to the axial skeleton, to the spine. All right. So it's a strut. Okay. So it's a bone that's really responsible for connecting a large force from the end of your fingers to the axial skeleton, which is where the force dissipates through. All right. So if you, you can imagine that if you have severe shortening of that, then suddenly the arm is going to become a lot weaker. All right, because again, moment equals force times distance. Your distance is reduced. All right, so the moment that you can generate is a lot less. All right, which is why if there is more than two centimeters shortening or more than 100% displacement, as there is here, and or threat to skin, which you can see, this is soft tissue shadow here. You can see that's the pull of the steroidal pulling that fragment up, and that's likely if that's left like that, that's likely to be poking through the skin by the time we come to our trauma conference the next morning. All right then these are the indications for sort of early, early surgery, or at least considering surgery sooner rather than later. The good thing about fixing a clavicle fracture is that you'll generally get a quicker return to function as well. So if you're going to treat this non-operatively, just in a sling, for whatever reason, then they'll be left in a sling for up to six weeks or so. Um, if we're going to plate it, then they can start doing some exercises pretty much straight away. All right. Which... For someone who might be a labourer doing gentle jobs and exercises and trying to earn a living is quite important as well. And also the sports stars and athletes, they're really keen about you know, not taking too much time off, off from their uh, competitive activity as well. So this is how we would usually go on to fix uh, a middle third clavicle fracture. These screw holes here, I won't generally let the registrars drill because underneath here is the subclavian artery and vein. Right? And what you don't want to see is pulsatile blood coming up through the clavicle because that's a bit of a disaster. So um, you've got to be really, really careful about um, sort of uh, drilling around this area. Around here, I, I don't mind as much, but it's still got to be very careful. Um, so acromioclavicular joint injuries. Uh, there's uh, these. This is the uh, ligament that sits between the acromion and the clavicle. And there's also some other associated ligaments around this area. There's basically, the complex is made out of a, a, a sling of, of, of three ligaments. You've got your corico, which is your coracoid to the chromion, corico chromio ligaments. Then you've got your coracoclavicular ligaments, coracoid to the clavicle, all right, which comprise of two. Don't get too bogged down in all this anatomy. Um, but the main one really is the acromioclavicular ligament. And all of this is to do with the stability of the clavicle around the shoulder. All right? So there is a classification here which again, don't get too bogged down with, it goes from one to six. Everything in orthopedics goes from one to something, usually six. So um, this is basically no different. So when you, when you have a type one, it's a sprain of that ligament, the acromioclavicular ligament. Uh, when you get to two, there's a slight rupture, but the clavicle's not too displaced. You get to three and the clavicle starts flopping about a bit. And when you get to four, the clavicle starts moving quite a lot. All right. So when you get to four, five and six, we operate on these routinely. Okay. Because basically the clavicle is quite unstable because a lot of the suspensory ligament complex is gone. All right. If it's an athlete, a pro athlete, all right, we might consider fixing three, okay, just to prevent any um, ACJ sort of arthritic changes and things in the future, all right. But again, that's not that's not always definite. But for a four onwards, we will consider doing it, all right. And again, it's the importance of getting X-rays in two planes because the only way you can know that the clavicle is moving forward or backwards, all right, you won't be able to see that from the front. So you've got to get a projection looking on the top to see if that clavicle is moving uh, forwards or backwards as well, all right. And uh, the way we would do that, normally we would put a plate, a small plate, two or three holes on the top of the clavicle, and we would plate, put a sort of a synthetic ligament that loops around this coracoid here, like a sling, and it sits under there, goes back up, attaches back into that plate, and it just fastens down, and it pulls that clavicle back down to where it should be seated, and then let everything heal in that position, right? Because otherwise the clavicle, as you'll see in this picture in a minute, pops up like this. So that's the sort of injury you may see coming into your clinic, all right? And if that comes into your clinic, something like that, that gives you an idea that they've had a, a cranioclavicular joint injury, all right? Quite a severe one, probably. We don't always have to operate on these. You know, if, if 
if they're um, someone who a doesn't want surgery and b not fit for surgery, we might just leave it and just benign neglect and just say, well, just you know, you can live with it. And um, if you develop any arth arthritis in that joint, we can always excise that joint in the future. But in you know, for labourers, people who are doing overhead work, things like that, they're not going to tolerate that. The majority of people would consider an operation for something like that as well. All right. And also, you've got to bear in mind the tinting of the skin as well. All right. You can see that tint skin is tinted, but you know, you've got to make that judgment call. If it's been like that for six weeks, it's probably unlikely to go through the skin. If it's been like that for a couple of days, you might be thinking, I need to probably do something about this. And this is what the x-ray will look like. So here's your clavicle, and this is your acromion here, all right? So this is, you can see that it's dissociated, like 100% displacement, and the clavicle's popped up. So coming on to wrist fractures, uh, bimodal distribution. In the young patients, it's usually high energy injury. In the older patients, it's usually just, a, again, a fall. It's all to do with the um, sort of bone density and uh, how thick or thin the bone is. As we get older, it's not as strong as it used to be. So uh, this is the normal anatomy. So radius ulna, radiocarpal joint, because this is your carpus. These are the carpal bones, all right, in the wrist, all right. And um, you can see here there's a fracture just going through just down here, this is what a fracture will look like, or a broken, broken wrist. All right. You can also see here there's a something called an ulnar styloid fracture. All right. So for those who are sort of keen-eyed, keep an eye out for that because this gives you an idea that the fracture is more unstable than just meets the eye. All right. This gives an indication that um, this is a fairly uh, significant and unstable injury. So when I'm fixing these fractures or reducing them, the sort of three main parameters I'm trying to look at to reduce them and get them in a better position. So we look at something called the radial inclination, all right? So that's the angle between these two lines here, all right? Again, don't get too bogged down, but that should be about 20 degrees. We look at the uh, height between the tip of the ulna and the tip of the radius, and that should be about 20 millimeters, all right? And uh, then we look at um, the volar tilt, all right? Which is basically the radius should be tilted towards the ground slightly by about 10 degrees. So 20, 20, 10, that's what we're looking for. And if you are going to manipulate them, then um, this is the way you do it, all right? So if you notice here that the bone is usually, this, this corner here is just hitched, all right? So you can't just squeeze it back into position because there's usually a bit of a fragment that's hitched on the bone. So when you go down to reduce these, um, you actually have to make the deformity worse before you make it better. And you see parents' faces when you're doing this manipulation, and like, has this guy ever done this before? Um, but then you've just got to explain, look, I, I know what I'm doing, and I've done this a few times, and I'm making this worse, just because you can unhitch this area here. Can you see there's a bit of a gap now, yeah, compared to that? And once you unhitch that, you can then put some traction on it, pull it back round into a straight position, and you'd normally apply a cast at that point, all right? If it's an unstable injury, you probably treat, uh, you probably want to consider an operation, but if it's stable and you think, you, you know, the patient will be better suited to cast immobilization, you put a plaster cast on it, all right? If I'm going to go and do an operation, this is usually the approach that I would use, so um, use something called an FCR approach. So um, if you all take your uh, thumb and little finger, and uh, hold them together, squeeze them together, and then bring the wrist towards you. You can see a big tendon sat in the front, which Tim was talking about this morning. That's called your uh, palmaris longus. 10% of the room apparently won't have it, but you probably all do. And then just to the radial side, so the outside of that, um, is your FCR tendon, right? That's your flexor carpi radialis. And that's the tendon that we will aim to go through, or the, the sheath through that, move it to the side, and we'll use the interval between the radial artery and that tendon to go down. And then there's this big fan-shaped muscle called your pronator quadratus, which sits just over the uh, distal radius. And we'll use that to retract back, put the plate down, look at those three parameters I was telling you about, 20, 20, 10, make sure we've got the plate and screws in a good position on, under x-ray guidance. And then we put that fan-shaped muscle back over the top to give it some protection. Uh, and that pronator quadratus is is important for um, pronation, all right? So um, you know, pronator teres is the main one, but um, pronator quadratus also supplies quite a bit as well. So it's important that you try and repair that at the end of the operation, all right? Sometimes the brachioradialis muscle, which comes down here, is attached into the radial styloid down here, and we have to release that just because that, that may be exerting a bit of a force or a pull that um, stops us from being able to reduce this fragment up here. But it's quite rare that we have to do that. So... Coming on to uh, hip fractures, um, becoming increasingly common due to an ageing population. Um, in a young patient, it's a really rare injury, all right? and if it does happen, it's usually because of high energy, high energy trauma, like a road traffic accident. But in the elderly patient, this is sort of a pre-morbid injury, all right? in the sense that it gives you an idea of someone's uh, biology on their function. If someone develops a hip fracture as they're getting older, 
30%, we know that 30% of these people are going to die within a year, all right? And that statistic hasn't really changed since I started my orthopedic training over the past 10 years, all right? Which probably says a bit about the fact we've got an aging population. So whilst the population's aging and our medicine may be catching up, they're probably going at the same sort of rate. So actually that statistic is still standing true. But also, you know, they come in, especially after COVID, they're quite frail. They've been sat at home for a long period of time. They're very deconditioned, all right? They've got lots of medical management, which uh, has been difficult to manage in the community, and they've not really been coming to hospitals. So we are actually finding now as well, more than ever, that the patients are probably in a worse way than they were prior to COVID. So whether that will have a knock-on effect on these statistics in the future, I don't know. But actually, I think our mortality rates are pretty, pretty good here, aren't they? We've got a pretty, pretty good mortality rate. I'll say everything good about this place, but seriously, we have got a pretty good <laughs> mortality rate. Um, so, yeah, and it's all about what they were like before they had the accident, all right? It's um, all about what their function was. If they had a good function before, they're likely to have a good function after is greater. But if they were pretty poor before, then this is a significant risk to them, all right, getting through a hospital episode and actually making it out of hospital. So, a bit of anatomy. This is the femoral head. This is the neck. This is what we call the intertrochanteric area because it's the area between the greater trochanter and the less trochanter, which sit here. And then anywhere five centimetres below the less trochanter, which is this area here, is called the subtrochanteric region, all right? And um, essentially, everything comes down to the blood supply around the hip. That's how everything we manage in neck of femur fractures is all to do with blood supply, all right? And essentially, the blood supply comes in in this intertrochanteric line, it, and it moves upwards towards the femoral head. Right, that's all you need to know really. We won't go into the nitty gritty of it all, but essentially it just goes up there. All right? So these are the sort of fracture patterns that you can have. And um, these two are known as intracapsular fractures. So these are fractures that occur within that capsule that attaches between this line here. All right? So the capsule attaches here and the blood supply comes up here. And these two are, are fractures that occur within the capsule. So they're intracapsular fractures. All right? This is called a intertrochanteric fracture and this is subtrochanteric fracture and these two are extracapsular fractures so they're outside of the capsule right well why is that important it's important because um, anything within the capsule the blood supply is likely or, or has a chance of being interrupted all right so anything within here if you imagine that the blood vessels coming up here they may they may be distorted or interrupted all right anything around here the blood supply isn't likely to be too distorted because the blood the blood supply are actually coming in from the capsule which is down this line and it's coming up here all right so this fracture is outside of where the blood zone is as is this one all right so these two we don't get too worried about the blood supply going to the femoral head all right whereas these two we do get worried and then taking that stage further there's a classification for intracapsular fractures so again if you imagine the blood vessels are coming up here this, this is called a garden classification. One is a small little chip through the femoral neck. Two is a fracture going all the way through the femoral neck, but it's not displaced. Three is a bit of displacement, and four is the ice cream's falling off the cone, all right? Well, why is that important? Well, if you imagine here, you don't think the blood supply is going to be too interrupted with these two, because if the blood supply is coming up here, it's coming up here, it's not going to be too distorted. Right? There may be a fracture, but it's not too distorted. Whereas here, you can start thinking, oh, those, those blood, blood vessels are going to struggle to get across that gap, yeah? And even here, you've got no chance, yeah? So that's why the way we manage these is the garden classification. I'll, t I'll teach you this. So one, two, screw, three, four. There used to be this hemiarthroplasty, which is half a hip replacement, called an Austin Moore. So one, two, screw, three, four, Austin Moore. All right? So that's how we remember it. So, that's, so with these, we put a screw in to try and restore the blood supply and keep the blood supply there because we don't think the femoral head's going to die off because the blood supply will be all right. Whereas three and four, the ones where they started tilting and the, the, blood, the blood wasn't going to cross the gap, um, we just don't take a chance and don't bother. We just say, right, we'll just replace half the hip joint and uh, put one of these hemiarthroplasties in, all right? This is the intertrochanteric fracture. So this is outside the capsule, the one between the line. You can see the fracture line down there. And we'd use this thing called a DHS, which is a dynamic hip screw, which causes a bit of collapse, but it, um, the pretty pretty good devices. And if done well, it can be done in about 30 minutes, all right? Um, this is subtrochanteric fracture. These are really tricky, tricky fractures to fix and, and to um, stabilize, actually. And the majority of that is because of the deforming forces, again, around the femur. All right? So you've got loads and loads of strong muscles attaching into the femur. So actually putting, it, putting a nail down and putting the screw in is actually the easy bit. It's because of all of this muscle st structure attachment that's attached to it that causes the problem. So um, you've got your abductors, which sit on the side, the greatest trochanter, and they pull it out to the side, the, the, the fragment at the top. 
Now you've got your iliopsoas, which is the main flexor of the hip, which pulls it forward, all right? And then you've got your adductors, which attach onto the adductor tubercle and, and the thigh, and they pull the, the fragment of the shaft inwards. So it's no good sometimes, you know, these patients are quite strong, actually. Some of them are quite bulky as well. You, you put in all your foot, I'm quite scrawny as well, right? So um, you put in all your force onto this to try and straighten it out, and um, it's still not straightening. So a lot of the time, what we have to do is um, make, make an incision on the side, outside, see the fracture, open it, make sure there's no muscle in the way, and then we use these special clamps to sort of manoeuvre things back into place. And then once you've got a straight structure, then you can start thinking about um, put it, putting a, a nail down the middle, all right? So you should, um, for me, you make, you make everything straight, and then once you've made it all straight, then you'll put the nail down the middle. And one of the things that registrars, orthopedics really struggle with is this, they start trying to approach it and they start banging a nail in whilst it's like this and they say oh it's all right I'll, I'll get the nail to reduce the fracture and all that and then they end up in a world, whole world of bother and um, you know the key is get everything straight first then put the nail down and then you're generally in a much better place right sometimes you have to use these things called cables to hold everything together as well but don't need to worry about it too much so um ACL injuries, I know they've been talked about in the, in the knee lecture, but um, this is sort of mechanism. It leads to anterior and lateral rotatory instability, half of not all knee injuries, and um, non-contacting pivoting injury, football skiing, basketball, and rugby. So um, I put this chap up there because he's one of my heroes. I'm a big Man United fan, and uh, which I shouldn't really declare at the moment because we're terrible. But um, the, he injured his uh, ACL during this, this manoeuvre, and you can see this is the sort of mechanism that, that, that will occur to cause it. So one of the key things to look out for with an ACL is a pop. You may hear a pop, patient may hear a pop. They'll get pain in the knee, swelling, may, may have some instability going forward, right? Some footballers will just have it and then they'll try and play on and then the legs are all really wobbly. You hear that quite often and uh, that's sort of an indicator that, you know, something, something's gone wrong and they'll have difficulty weight bearing. Now, I'm just putting this x-ray up. You may or may not see x-rays, like I said, you may only see reporting. But if you ever see an x-ray with this sign here, or you see a report saying something called a lipohemarthrosis, right? which sounds like a really big word, but if you break it down, it's pretty simple. Any arthrosis is something in a joint. If you get a hemarthrosis, that's blood in a joint, right? which will look like this, like this white sort of colour, dense colour. And then if you get a lipo, which is fat, so lipo is always fat, that looks like this darker colour. All right? So fat shows up dark, blood shows up lighter on an x-ray, all right? This is called a lipohemarthrosis. Now, you can get just a hemarthrosis if you get an innocuous injury in the knee or you get some blood in the knee or a meniscal injury, right? But if you have any injury to bone or ligament, so a ligament is attached into bone, well, bone consists of fat, right? So fat is within bone, like bone marrow. You know, bone contains a lot of fat. So when you break something or the ligament pulls off the bone, as that happens, fat gets expelled in the environment, right? So what happens is the fat goes into the knee, and if you remember from like GCSE chemistry or you know when you're a bit younger, even when you're cooking, if you put fat in water, it always rises to the top, doesn't it? Yeah. So if you get a patient to lie down on the couch and they've got their knee like that, the fat will always rise to the top, which is why the, that's a lipohemarthrosis, right? So you'll see this sort of shadow at the top, which gives you an indication there's a bony injury or an ACL injury that's going on here. All right. So we've already talked about the Lackman's test. It's a better test than an anterior draw test. And this is the sort of thing that we do. I can't emphasize enough about prehab, right? So regardless of whatever happens with this patient, physiotherapy should be the first thing that you refer these patients for. Because even if they go on to an ACL reconstruction, if the knee's better conditioned and in a better state, their outcome from a knee ACL reconstruction will be a lot, lot higher. And actually after physiotherapy, around 30% don't actually need any surgery. They'll come back to a knee clinic and say, my knee feels stable again. And it can actually see me out doing the, the, the sports I want to be able to do. So tibial shaft fractures, I won't go on about this too much, but basically most common long bone fracture, they're pretty severe. The tibia is quite a subcutaneous bone. You can feel it all the way down your leg. So when it fractures, there's a significant risk that the um, bone starts poking out through the skin. So it may end up like this. All right? This is called an open fracture. Okay, And um, you've got to watch out for this because obviously you can get swelling, open fractures. They're at significant risk of developing infection and wound complications. And we don't really see many of these in district general hospitals now. They all go straight to Sheffield because in order to manage these, there's a national directive that you have to have plastic surgeons on site. So that's why Sheffield will take all of these because they'll generally have to do a flat reconstruction 
um, for these. And also they've got a big frame service available in Sheffield as well. So actually these are an emergency, they'll go straight to Sheffield a lot of the time. But if they ever do pitch up in Rotherham Hospital, we'll manage them immediately with antibiotics, um, you know, dressings, a plastic cast and get them straight over to Sheffield because time is of the essence really. So one of the other things you've got to watch out for is compartment syndrome, right? So with these fractures, there's uh, four main compartments in the lower leg. And basically, compartments are a group of muscles that are bound by, if you imagine cling, cling film, all right? We call it fascia, okay? So if you imagine that muscles are within the cling film, when you have a fracture, you get loads and loads of blood inside those muscle compartments. But it can only expand to a certain amount because that cling film is in a tightly compact space, all right? So essentially, when that swelling gets so severe, it gets to a point where the capillary inflow can't, can't produce any blood supply to the muscles anymore. So the muscles start dying off, the nerves start dying off, and you're not getting any blood flow to the lower leg. And that's an emergency. And the way that that will present will be pain, 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 out of proportion to the context of the injury. All right? So they've got a fracture, but the pain will just be unrelenting. You'll give them morphine, you'll, you'll split the cast, you'll do everything, but the pain will just be severe. All right? And that's a diagnosis of clinical suspicion, right? So you don't wait for any pressure monitoring, you don't wait for any further investigations or imaging, you just literally get these patients straight to the theatre and we'll do something called a fasciotomy, which is where we'll make two incisions, one down either side of the leg, to decompress those, those muscles wrapped in cling film, right? So we'll make incisions down the cling film, essentially, to decompress and allow those muscles to swell. And then we'll worry about stabilising the fracture, potentially with an, a temporary frame, or, or maybe maybe we will put a uh, nail down the middle of the bone, all right, depending on whether we think that there's no risk of infection and the skin wounds will close eventually. But usually we'll put an external frame as a temporary manoeuvre there. And um, we may or may not need plastic surgeons later on after doing the fasciotomy to get those wounds closed. Because if you imagine, because they're so swollen, once we've made those skin incisions, the skin edges will evert, so getting them to close again may be difficult. So we may need to call Sir Sheffield at a later time to put a, put a flap over, a, a skin graft or a flap over them to um, get them to close. It's rare for that to happen, but it's just something to bear in mind. But if you ever get a patient with this, compartment syndrome, and it's getting to the point where you can't feel a pulse and um, it's starting to become painless and, and uh, they're losing sensation, it's too late. The leg's going to die off by that point, all right? So you've missed the boat. So it's pain, pain, pain. And uh, the key feature with this is also moving the toes. So it's passive um, stretching of the toes because that'll give you an indication of the toes moving within the compartments, the muscles in the compartments. And if that, those are causing a lot of pain, the likelihood of a compartment syndrome is quite high. All right? It'd be very unusual to see, to see, for you to see this in this sort of community setting just as an outpatient, but just be aware of in the emergency setting. So this is MMA fighting. I don't really like it, but I just thought it was a cool picture. So... Um, uh, you can see he's got a bit of a bendy leg. So that's most likely a tibial shaft fracture. He's going to struggle to walk on that. And then this is the operation we would normally do for straightforward fractures. Um, putting a nail down the middle of the bone, holding it in place. We'd ream that out. The biggest risk factor for this not healing is usually smoking or an open fracture. So if someone's a smoker, we severely or well, highly recommend that they do not continue smoking because um, if that doesn't unite, that can be a real tricky, tricky problem to uh, manage. Right, um, like I say, subcutaneous bone has not got much fat and muscle around it, and bone needs muscle supply around it to get blood supply into it. So for any subcutaneous bones or bones that aren't surrounded by much muscle, their rate of healing is usually pr fairly poor. So just a bit about ankle fractures, and then I think we'll be done. Um, so this is this is keeping it really really simple or as simple as I can. Um, this is a Weber classification. All right, so. Type A, type B, type C, all right? Essentially, type A is, you know, the, usually due to inversion sorts of injuries, or you can get pronation external rotation injuries, or you can get supination external rotation injuries. Don't worry about all of that. Essentially, if you have an injury to an ankle, these are the sort of three main patterns that you may get a fracture in the fibula, all right? And essentially, A, we don't get too worried about. We can just put them in a boot, get them walking, and the stability of the ankle is not too too much of a problem. It may become a problem later because the ATFL, which is the anterior talofibular ligament, is attached to this fragment at the, at the bottom. And if that doesn't unite for whatever reason, they may have some instability in the ankle and some pain. But in a sort of acute setting, it's not much of an issue. And we can usually just put them in a boot, get them weight bearing, and the fracture will heal itself. Type B and type C, we've got a low threshold for fixing. And that's because the fracture usually is, is around or above the level of the syndesmosis. You may have heard of the syndesmosis, which is a ligament that sits between the tibia and the fibula, okay? So it's, a really, it's made out of like five main ligaments, the syndesmosis, but essentially 
uh, and, and the posterior, the ones at the back are the strongest. But essentially, if that ligament goes, it can cause a lot of instability of the ankle itself, and the risk of arthritis is fairly severe, all right, and ongoing pain. Um, so we have a low threshold for fixing these to bring the stability back to the ankle. And the one thing I'll say about the ankle as well is um, it's not like the hip on the knee. The hip and knee is quite a forgiving, they're quite forgiving joints. Um, you know, in terms of restoring the perfect anatomy, even if you're a couple of mils out, patients will still do pretty well, all right? The thing about the ankle is it's such a congruent joint that even a millimetre of displacement within the configuration of the ankle, in terms of the complexity of the ankle and the configuration of it, a millimetre of displacement leads to between 70 and 80% increased contact pressures, all right? So if you translate that, the risk of arthritis by even a mil of displacement is significantly higher, all right? But that's why I enjoy it, because it's quite a finesse surgery and you've got to get things back where they were, all right? But at the same time, we don't have as much room for error or as much margin for um, displacement as you may do with other types of fractures, all right? So other fractures, we may accept more angulation and more deformity and allow them to heal and they'll still have good function, such as in the shoulder, because it moved a lot. Whereas in the ankle, we don't really accept too much at all, all right? Well, in fact, we don't accept anything, all right? If it's not perfect, then you've got to be really seriously considering uh, an operation to fix it. So this is an x-ray of, um, well, most likely a bimalleolar ankle fracture. So the main fractures you can get uh, are bimalleolar and trimalleolar ankle fractures in terms of severe fractures. So that's when you've got uh, a medial malleolus fracture, which is on the inside, and you've got a fibular fracture, which is on the outside. So this is what we call a Weber C fracture because it's above, the, imagine the syndesmosis is about this level here. It's above the level of the syndesmosis, so it's likely to be quite um, dis um, unstable. And the thing about the human anatomy as well is, it's like a polo mint. Whenever something breaks, all right, it doesn't break in one place. It always goes through two places. All right? So the force usually will go in through here, exit, get exit up here and out here, all right? which is why you've ended up with a break in two places. All right? And that's the same for pelvic anatomy, it's usually the same for forearm anatomy, it's usually the same for anything, all right? So you've, if you've already got one broken area, you've got to be suspecting another one somewhere else, all right? It might be that it's just a ligament that it's torn, but usually the force goes through two, two areas in the human body, all right? And it's no different in the ankle, all right? So these are the main malleoli, so lateral malleolus, medial malleolus, posterior malleolus, and you can see there's fractures of all three here, all right? So that's a trimalleolar ankle fracture, so three fractures within the ankle, all right? So that's the most severe of all types. And the reason that this f fracture at the back is really important, we used to, back in the day, before foot and ankle surgery, it's a, it's a fairly new form of orthopedic surgery, foot and ankle surgery, relatively. But um, people just used to ignore this fracture and just say, oh, if it's less than 25%, we'll just ignore it or we'll fix it from the front and we'll do all this crazy stuff. Whereas, as I said to you before, do you remember the syndesmosis, right? Syndesmosis is a band of ligaments that sits between the tibia and fibula. It causes instability. Well, this chunk of bone here has the posterior uh, inferior tibiofibular ligament attached to it, PITFL, all right? That is the main ligament within the syndesmosis. That, that comprises 70% of the syndesmotic stability, that ligament, okay? So remember I said there's five of them. Well, that's one of them at the back attaching onto that fragment. So whilst it's just a fracture, it's not just a fracture, it's a fracture that has the strongest ligament in the ankle attached to it, all right? Or the strongest part portion of the syndesmosis attached to it, which is why we would go on to fix these. This is how we would do a bimalleolar, plate and screws on the outside and screws on the inside. But this is a trimalleolar ankle fracture. So the re we would fix this from the back, all right? So um, Georgia who was here yesterday, was in theatre with me when I, um, she's one of the physios who came and joined me in theatre. And um, she came and assisted me uh, fixing one of these ankle fractures. And we put a plate from the back, very similar to this. And the reason we put this back, hold this back in place is to, to protect that ligament and secure that ligament back in place. We're not too bothered about the fracture itself, we're more bothered about the ligament that's attached to that bony piece, right? which is why we'll try and restore it and put it back there. Great, any questions?